If you look at a map of Israel, you discover two main bodies of water in that region, and only two. Up in the north is the Sea of Galilee, and C is a bit optimistic. It's 13 miles long, seven and a half miles wide. It's beautiful, but how large is Lake Tyler? How large is Lake Palestine? Sea is optimistic. It's more lake than sea, the Galilee. Under the water, though, they found over 22 different varieties of fish in the Sea of Galilee. And if you look at that area from above, you'll see that all around the sea, it's green. It's the greenest part of the country, the greenest area for hundreds and hundreds of miles. The lake area is alive. There's fruit trees, there's vegetation. It is lovely. It is lovely, and it is essential for life in that part of the world. Now, around 60 miles to the south of the Galilee is the other great body of water. It's called the Dead Sea. It's called that because even though 2 million gallons of water flow in every day from the Jordan River, every day, none of that water goes beyond the Dead Sea. It's as if the water goes into the Dead Sea and it dies there. It's 47 miles long. It is nine and a half miles wide. It is the lowest point on the surface of the earth. The Dead Sea, though, contains 30 grams of salt per liter. Now, for those of you all like me that are not chemists, what that means in real time is illustrated. So years ago, I was at the Dead Sea, and I thought one afternoon, I think I'm going to read the paper. And I got a copy of the newspaper, and I went and I sat on the surface of the Dead Sea, the surface, and read the paper with the water below me. 30 grams of salt per liter means there is no life. There are no animals. There's no vegetation. The shores around the Dead Sea are that. They are barren. There's these two bodies of water in this region, only two, and it is an amazing contrast. The Sea of Galilee in the north, the Dead Sea in the south. And it strikes me that the physical geography of Israel is a portrait of the spiritual reality of human beings. For just as there's one seed that breeds life and fruitfulness, and there's another seed that breeds death. So there are two conditions of people. There are two main roads that people can choose to follow. And that destination is alluded to in that final sobering word from Jesus in the gospel today. One is described in the Bible as a person who is in Adam. In Adam. If we are in Adam, it says in the scripture, we are a people who continually breed sin and death. That is our path. It's the dominant way that we've chosen to live our lives. The other condition of people is those who are in Christ. It is those who follow the spirit of God dwelling in them. It's those who continually yield life, whether it's actually coming to the surface or not. In Adam, in Christ. Every person is living in one or the other. Every person is living in Adam or in Christ. There's no other options. It's a path. There's deviation. There's one step forward, one step back. That's always true. But there are two dominant paths. And it's a choice we make. And all of us have to deal with that choice every day and deal with the consequences of that choice. And everyone else surrounds us deals with the consequences of each other's choices all the time. All the time. 
It's like the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. 1 Corinthians 15 says this of people. It says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all are made alive. There is life, there is death. There is this path, there is that one. There is this choice, there is that choice. This morning offers a powerful lesson from Romans. It's powerful, Romans chapter 5 beginning in verse number 18. It's a little heady. It's a little heady. It's not necessarily common when these passages come up in the lectionary that we go there because it takes a little work to consider Romans chapter 5, but we can do that. And it is worth the read. Look for a moment at your epistle lesson. It says this, beginning in verse 18, it says, Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. See, it's a little heady, but bear with me. It continues, for just as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The trespass referred to here was Adam's decision to sin. The story that's told in Genesis chapter 3. You remember that story. Adam breaks the one rule. One rule that God established in the garden. Don't eat fruit from that tree. And Adam goes, let's have some. The consequence of that decision has for thousands of years been referred to in the church with a capital C as the fall. Meaning the fall from this state of gracious living with God. The consequence of breaking that rule is a separation, an estrangement, ultimately an expulsion from the proverbial Garden of Eden, not just for Adam and Eve, but for all of us. The fall describes a state of acute alienation from God. Adam, remember, is a story about us. Adam, remember, is a Hebrew word, the word Adam. You know what that word means? It means human being. The story of Adam and Eve, and Adam especially in Genesis 2 and 3, is a story about people. It's not supposed to be a history lesson about this one man that made a terrible mistake. Whatever we want to do with the historicity of Genesis 2 and 3, the important piece for us is what it means about all of us. Adam, Adam, human being. Adam's decision reflects our choice. Our choice again and again to disobey God's rules. To go our own way. Look at verse 19. It continues this. By the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So what happens as a consequence of Adam's transgression? Human beings inherit the sin nature. It's inherited. The nature in us, the nature, the movement, the desire to sin isn't something we choose. It's something into which we're born. St. Augustine of Hippo described it 1,500 plus years ago as original sin. It's like viral DNA within us. We can't expel it. We can't get rid of it. We can't help it when we're going to have kids. We can't stop them from being born with it. It's just a part of being human. It means that we're born with a built-in desire to go our own way and to disobey God. And I remember... Growing up, I remember reading this stuff and thinking, that just, that can't be true. Look at the babies. They're so precious. There's no viral DNA there. Oh my goodness, they're just so adorable. They're so wonderful. And then we had children. (laughs) Which is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. But you learn when you're a parent. You learn when you're a parent that the first word of your child is not Dada or mama. The first word that they say out loud is what? No. No. 
They're precious, they're beautiful, they're amazing, and they're precious little sinners. <laughs> From the beginning, that's what it means to be in Adam. That's what it means to be in Adam. Disobedience is hardwired in here from birth, from conception, and then from birth. Therefore, we are born sinners. We are born estranged from God. And therefore, the consequence is what? We are born condemned. We are born as people who've been asked to leave the garden because we cannot inherently obey the rules. It's the consequence of our sin nature. But this is a hopeful word, Romans 5. Look at the second half here in verse 18. It says, also, one act of righteousness leads to what? Justification and life. That act of righteousness, that righteous act was a decision as well. But not a decision that we made. It's the decision of Jesus Christ to allow people to kill him on the cross. Jesus did not commit suicide. The crucifixion is a homicide, and yet it is God incarnate who died, which means what? He could have made a different choice. He was still fully God from fully God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through whom all things were made at any moment. Jesus could have said, enough, and frozen time, and said, I'm doing something else. But he did not. He allowed them to grab him, allowed them to arrest him, allowed them to beat him, allowed them to torture him, allowed them to crucify him, allowed them to put him to death. Why did he do that? God allowed people to put him to death. Why? It says in Romans 5. Because through Christ's death, we are justified and made alive. The word justified means we're made right with God. Through Christ's death, we are given life, abundant life on the earth. A rich, meaningful, purposeful life that's not driven by the carnal, that's not driven by sin nature, that's not dr driven by what do I want, what can I do, what's in it for me? No, we can be bigger and better and different than that because Christ who lives in us. And we, of course, can know eternal life when our days on the earth have come to an end. Remember that story when Jesus approaches John the Baptist to be baptized at the Jordan River? It's a curious exchange, you remember? Jesus has not performed a miracle. He hasn't preached a sermon, nothing. He hasn't gathered a disciple. He's just a dude walking up to the Jordan River, if you will. And on that day, John sees him and says what? John points to Jesus and says, behold the Lamb of God who what? Who takes away the sin of the world. We'll say it in a moment in the Eucharistic prayer. Why would he say that? Because as the blood of the sacrificial lamb on the Jewish day of atonement ceremonially washed away the sins of the people of God for a year, every year, the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross cleanses us from the grip and power of sin forever. That's grace. That's justification and life. And look at the second half of verse 19. It says, through Christ, many will be made righteous. Made righteous. Made righteous by God. When we become Christians, we are made righteous by God. We don't make ourselves righteous. We don't save ourselves. We are made righteous by him. Meaning, as we say in East Texas, we're saved by Jesus Christ. So what it means to be made righteous. Made righteous is the formal biblical language, but that's not the language of the street, is it? Nobody comes up to someone else and trying to get to know them as a Christian and says, so when was it that you were made righteous? 
we'd say about being saved. But that's what happened. Saved forever. Sin is still here. There's still temptation. Right? But our fundamental core identity is no longer that of a sinner, but that of a saint. We can make a different choice. We can be a different people. From Adam to Christ. From in Adam to in Christ. From the from the Dead Sea to the Sea of Galilee. Something radical happens when we're born again. And it's radical in here. It is so radical that Paul wrote this to the Corinthian church. He wrote, if anyone is in Christ, they are what? A new creation. A different human. It's like that viral DNA is what? Has been transformed into something new. The old things have passed away. All things have become new in them. One scholar has proposed two important lessons from this section. One, at birth we inherit the consequence of Adam's sin. It's just what it is. We are born into this world with a nature that is self-intoxicated, that is inherently narcissistic, that seeks to pursue its own interest, that is all about ourselves. It is just hardwired that is then God hostile because it seeks to follow God inherently, it seeks to follow its own desires. Original sin lives in all of us from birth. That's true. Human beings are born into the Dead Sea. Sure, we can do things that have good in them. We can. And we have all kinds of evidences of people when we're Christians, when we're children, when we're non-Christians who do things that are lovely and beautiful, but sin is always there on our own. Our best is never completely good. It's always colored by what's in it for me. Genesis 8.21 teaches this. The intention of a person's heart is evil from his youth. It means even those things that we do outside of faith, Outside of the work of Christ, if they look great, it's like, yeah, but there's still something there that says, yeah, but take a look at this. And how is this going to help me get there? There's something transactional still in that. We hear that today. That same word is what's spoken of in Romans 5. We are born into this world in Adam. That's number one. Number two, grace always overcomes sin. Grace wins. Look at Romans 5.20, this next verse. It says, the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded much more. He's not referring to the U.S. Penal Code when he says the law. He's not referring to the uniform tort laws. The law is referring to the law of Moses, which is God's revelation of these are the boundaries. This is how to live. It says, but where sin increased, grace abounded much more, which means regardless of sin, grace always comes out ahead. Because the grace of God is bigger and more powerful and more beautiful than the grip that sin has on us. For the believer, grace wins. The believer means one who said, I'll take that, Lord. I will believe in you, Lord. I will follow you, Lord. I will accept the transformation, enabling me to be bigger and better than the original sinner that lives here. Grace reveals God's nature, his unconditional love. The New Testament is clear that heaven is a gift of God. We don't work for it. We don't earn our way in. Christ did the work on the cross. And I know that for many, this teaching about grace it's difficult because it raises a big question. Does the scripture teach that when I become a Christian, because of God's grace, I can go and live any way that I want? And the answer to that question has led the church to come up with all kinds of additional things people had to do. I mean, it started really in the early medieval era. It's like saying, I'm so worried people are going to abuse what the scripture says about grace, that we're going to make them also have to kind of earn it. Right? I mean, so we developed all kinds of things. It's like you got to, 
you got to earn it, right? Whether it was making your confession privately to a priest, whether it was making a pilgrimage somewhere, whether it was praying to the bones of St. Teresa of Avila, hoping that somehow with her help, right, we can be okay with God. I mean, we've been doing that in the church almost from the fourth century. That this scripture made us uncomfortable, this teaching about grace. Thinking, man, when I, so it says when I become a Christian because of the grace of God, I can go and live any way that I want. And church leaders would be so worried that people would abuse it. They would say, yeah, so here's a long list of things you also need to do. But that's not the scripture. If we do not read chapter 5 in Romans without the somewhat uneasy feeling that believers are free to live and make bad choices and still receive the love of God, we have not understood chapter 5. We have not understood grace. If we read the scripture and still find ourselves thinking, yeah, but I need to do X, Y, and Z, we're not understanding the cross. We're not understanding what unconditional love means because it means just that. It is unconditional. If you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what? You will be saved. You don't have to do these 50 things. You don't have to prove it. You have to trust in him and live. It's a beautiful word. Now, Romans is going to respond to a concern about people abusing the grace of God in chapter 6, right after chapter 5, it's going to say this. May it never be that we would have cheap grace. It's going to say, no, you were designed to live in newness of life. You're designed to live faithfully, which is true, because God knows that there's a temptation to take his free gift for granted. I mean, Constantine, the emperor who in the fourth century really changed history by saying, I'm now a Christian and it's okay to be a Christian. We're not going to feed you to the lions anymore. He famously didn't get baptized until he was on his deathbed. And the reason was because, you know, he believed that once he was baptized, he was going to be right with God. But he thought, you know, before then, I'm going to do whatever the heck I want. Right? I mean, there's something in us that sort of struggles with this issue about grace and all the rest. And that's why the letter of James was written, to respond to the same concern, right? And it reminds us that faith without works is dead. So it's not true that we just say words and we're going to be right with God no matter what. That's not what it means. Because the belief has to be in what? In here, not just out here. That's true. But hear this. If grace does not have the potential to be abused, it does not have the power to transform. If the knowledge of the grace of God does not have the potential to be abused, then it does not have the power to transform, that we do not understand it. It's a little like being at the Grand Canyon. Been at the Grand Canyon? You drive up to the Grand Canyon, and you get out of the car, and you walk up, and you see it is the most magnificent sight. But there is a major problem. Most of the Grand Canyon has no fences or walls that separate you from the abyss. And if you fall in, it's game over. Every year, more and more now since the selfie stick was invented, there's people who get into trouble at the Grand Canyon. But the problem is that you cannot experience the fullness, the beauty, the majesty of the Grand Canyon without coming up to the edge. Yes, believers can sometimes do take advantage of God's forgiveness. Yes, I believe it's true that every week there are people who are grateful for the confession in church because they think, all right, get that behind me. But there's something in your mind that says, yeah, but maybe this next week I can make a little more mischief. That's just true. Believers can and have and will take advantage of the grace of God. But God does not need us to safeguard his grace. God is Lord and judge of all. He doesn't need the church to invent new additional things people have to do to be saved. 
He says, I have done enough. When Jesus says on the cross, what? It is finished. There's nothing else the church needs to invent. There's nothing else we have to say. He has said and done it all. Remember David Brainerd. He's one of the early American missionaries. Brainerd lived among a people in the American West who were often drunk and had all kinds of immorality. There is a bit of a myth that we have about ourselves as Americans. There is a bit of a myth. And the myth sort of says that those early Americans, boy, they were, they were phenomenal Christians. They were these amazingly faithful people. But sometime, maybe, maybe in the 20s, the roaring 20s, maybe in the 30s, like every generation thinks oh, it was, it was our, our parents, our grandparents. Somebody, we just went the wrong way. People went a little rogue in this country. But that's not true. We lived in New Mexico for seven years before we moved to Tyler. And our favorite thing to do on the weekends was to go hiking in the mountains. And if you go in the mountains of New Mexico, you'll find there are these old ghost towns everywhere. Everywhere. And they're called ghost towns because they're uninhabited. But there was a time in which they were filled with people. And one of the most meaningful, memorable stories for me was this one ghost town about an hour and a quarter from Albuquerque. And you go through there and you barely get there with four wheel drive and on your feet and you get there and you realize 5,000 people used to live in this little valley, 5,000 people. And what's remarkable is in this little valley that once had 5,000 people in 1885, there were over 300 saloons. A hundred brothels and one church. <laughs> right? So David Brainerd was a missionary in that world. And Brainerd said this, I did not spend all my time preaching repent to those people. I never got away from teaching Christ and him crucified. He said, people still sinned in the Wild West. But he wrote this, I find that people begin to put on the garments of holiness, even in small matters, when they're possessed by Christ crucified. The love of Jesus changes us in here, in the heart. It changes us. The love of Christ takes us from a people who choose to live in the Dead Sea to people who live in the life-giving waters of the Galilee. Consider the cross. Consider it today when we pray. Consider it when you profess your faith. Consider it when you receive your Eucharist. Allow the unconditional love of Jesus for you to sink in. To sink in. And then walk out the door. And walk and live in gratitude for the love and mercy of God. Swim with thankfulness in the sea of God's deep, powerful grace. And live as a saint of God. Live like one who believes in Jesus. In the name of Father and Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.